I think I have a pretty unique story. I'm the youngest of three of a single mom. So I have some of the, the very stereotypical trappings of, of African-American men growing up, missing father figures, et cetera. My mom, however, did not struggle. My mother worked incredibly hard. She had her PhD by the time I was graduating from high school. So she put three children through college and got her PhD at the same time. So I have this unique perspective of having a lot of the markers of stereotypical black poverty, whatever, like seasonings and sprinkles of it, while also being exposed to high levels of achievement and relative privilege because of that. My mother was also a Black Panther in her youth, and I have a lot of like Pan-African, very Afrocentric, like a lot of stuff we call hoteps today that was native to me as a child which is why I look at it very differently now as an adult, especially compared to what I'm seeing now, which does not look like what I saw as a child. And even in that, because of my privilege, because that was very much a, a people's class-based movement, but a lot of that people's class-based struggle, I didn't feel. And then I, then I also went to a very diverse high school, economically and racially. So I have had the privilege and benefit of having this very unique perspective of the world growing up my entire life of being able to witness um, things and, and touch on different aspects of, of experiences, which informed my worldview. And while sometimes coming to clash with other people, because people have, can only see the world through the lens that they, they have access to. And so since my lens tends to in include all these other features, I have, I've been accused of being a hotel and accused of being, I can't think of the other, the opposite, but I've been, I've been accused of two different, like disparate things since I started my channel. I had somebody be overly critical of me because I was too pro-black. And then I've had people say, you, you hate black men at the same time. So my experiences made me feel very apart from people. And it wasn't like the, the like very classic, I didn't fit in with the black people stuff. Like I, I had no problem fitting in with black people. And you know, I had a, a strong love for my folks, but I was either around bougie black folks or black folks from the struggle. And I was, I won't say I was halfway in both worlds. I was 30% in the struggle, 70% in bougie. But like most people in bougie were 100% in bougie and had like no love for the struggle and vice versa. And so that was my experience, I should say. So when I got to college and I got to meet so many other black folks who had similar experiences, and then I got to have folks from struggle because, you know, HBCUs will take black folks from, you know, a lower economic status uh, backgrounds and build them into the best, most dynamic people in the game. So getting to like have that build me up into a different person was so valuable. I met my wife there and just so many different growth experiences came out of that. And this is a space that I've, you know, I've been I've been challenged on, but I'm, I'm kind of still going to stand on it. I think we underestimate um, coming out of the academy. I don't know if the lore of my background has been uh, put out there, but I was, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm ABD in my PhD program, and uh, I'm not gonna finish it just because I don't, I don't care enough. <laughs> I'm not getting enough money for YouTube. Yeah, we we did um, an episode but, on uh, the education, uh, the state industrial of education. complex. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so. But one thing I realized that took a little bit of my, went out of my sales in academia was, as I started getting into gender, there's so, there, there's just not enough about masculinity in, you know, academic gender discourses. And that's, I think, just to be honest, because there aren't enough men or males um, like doing it. Because you, right. you know, under no circumstances should there be a body of literature about a population where where very few people of that population are contributing to the body, and and so what I think exists here. This is why I was I'm, I'm such a big fan of Bell Hooks because she was one of the few scholars yeah. that I thought got some of the reality of what it, it means to like to what what the burden of patriarchy is. And I, like, how do you, like, I can't say patriarchy is a burden effectively to some people. Cause it's like, like, what, what do you mean? Like, it's a threat to me. And it's like, yeah, well, that's true. And it's not a threat to me in the same way, but I wish it was more understood how that works. 
And that's how these manosphere people kind of get a leg up is because they engage with that hurt, that space of hurt in a way that a lot of others even don't even know how to. I started out thinking I was going to be the next Puff Daddy for some reason. Like a rapper? No, no, like a, a music producer. I actually have a really funny story about meeting Akon's mom, hearing Akon's music and thinking it was bad, and then like completely dropping a significant opportunity to be on Akon's team. And so like after that happened, I realized I didn't have the chops for that. So I got into, uh, I got into the family business, which has been community service, community activism, teaching, whatever. So I became a teacher. And as a byproduct of that, of wanting to stay uh, engaged with youth, I've always been more than people my age paying attention to YouTube and whatever social media was at the time. The YouTube video essay left to commentary space has, is a very woman dominated space and a white male dominated space. And I appreciate the the many contributions I've gotten from those videos, but I've always felt, and I'm, I'm a consumer of like that stuff for years, since it really started being a thing in the, in the early 2010s. And so I was always kind of like, man, I really wish somebody was talking about these things that are of interest to me, but in a way that I rock with. And so I was like, let me be that person, basically. And people seem to respond to it because I, I, I guess I wasn't the only one missing that type of voice. I am a pop culture and media junk. Yeah, so like that's that's really where it starts is that that's just the stuff I would do if I had just no, no reason to make a video about it. I would want to watch as much as I can. And then I wanted to talk to people about what I watched. And then that also kind of is what got me to like being critical of things more because you see enough and you start to recognize patterns. Like I didn't go to school for film per se, but like you see enough movies, you start to recognize patterns. Like I'm a person where like, don't ask me like what's gonna happen next. Cause I'm gonna tell you, and I'm gonna probably be right. You know what I'm saying? Cause I like it. not even just like my wife still doesn't understand how I do it, you know? But once you understand stories and narrative, then you know what a creator is trying to do. So yeah, so like really it's just, um, I, I'm, I'm just a, a pop culture junkie. Uh, I was a teacher for 10 years. What did you teach? I taught English. So I'm also like a junkie of stories and like, you know, elements to storytelling. And so part of the enjoying media was also just keeping up with the kids and not wanting to be completely out of touch with what they're consuming. Cause you know, I've always believed that pop culture is just as valuable and depthful as Shakespeare and Chaucer and shit. So I am a former edge lord. Like I'm a former edgy guy. I want to say things, and I, I, you know, I'm super important. And oh, the Joker and Fight Club. Like I was into a lot of that um, coming out of high school, you know, undergrad. Um, and it colored the way I saw the world. And then as I grew and got older, I was like, ooh, ooh, I don't know about a lot of this stuff I've been thinking and doing for the last however long. And then like when I'm when I made that video, it was reflecting partially on my experiences and how I fell into this space where this media had gave color to a place I was in. And then it kind of reinforced it, it reflected it. I always be careful, it didn't cause it. That was where I was because of, you know, my insecurities and things I was going through in life. But the media gave me something to, to chew on that had the same energy. Can you explain the edgelord concept? An uh, edgelord is basically usually almost always a guy, um, almost always, you know, in the young adulthood, so we're talking about, you know, middle school to hopefully it's over by your early 20s. Some people, it never ends. And you feel the, the key thing is that your social society as it's been taught to you, which is still a legitimate thing, um, has not proven itself to be what you've been, what's been taught to you. You're usually on the outskirts of social, you know, of social circles, because you don't fit in, you, you know, you don't have good social skills, you're into niche things, whatever. And so you begin trying to understand that. You look for reasons to make sense of that experience. It's not a fun one. And then you start to, a lot of people, once, once they get there, they start to want to push the boundaries. And then they want to get reactions out of people. And then they want to, you know, claim power from that space. 
And then they just start getting really edgy. So they just want to be shocking and they want to, you know, they, they know how society really is. And there's a lot of really negative behavior that comes out of it. It's very connected to like red pill, insul uh, activity, because at, at the, fundamentally these are a lot of unhappy young men who are looking for reasons to explain their unhappiness. And the problem is the edginess doesn't explain it. What explains it is, you know, oppressive systems, oppressive uh, gender performance uh, rules for a lot of boys, um, capitalism, you know, getting into all the cold words. Um, and so you bring up Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, and that's one of the, the biggest things I want to get into is how I it the left had been thoroughly like the America's leftist past was thoroughly eradicated in the during the cold. Yes. And McCarthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the McCarthy era. And like I didn't really get like I'm just now fully understanding that. And that has a that has numerous effects, right? One of it's just the fact that it's allowed us to slide further into I call it diet fascism. And I don't know how long this is gonna be on a diet in this country the way we're going. Mm -hmm. Um but it's also made it's it's made recovering the left and any type of leftist ethos in our politics and our social interactions um so difficult because i'm of i'm of a generation i'm 40 so i was a child at the end of the cold war and i remember fallout drills i remember hiding under desks because the mm -hmm. russians i had mm -hmm. uh, plenty of anti-communist propaganda in my media um and i didn't know that mark the king was hated because he was a socialist you know what i'm saying i didn't know that malcolm x came back talking about socialism from mecca before he was murdered um I, these are things that are completely unknown and i had a and i had an intent i had a uniquely pro-black um radical black politics upbringing like as it's it's very very there's not too many people that had an upbringing like mine. Now, there's people that were more intensely brought up under that, you know, ethos. But like my mother, you know, was involved with, you know, Black Panther affiliate. Well, I'll say she's Black Panther affiliated because she was too young to really be in the streets like that. Um, my, a lot of my family were involved in radical back politics in Chicago. And I had no idea until relatively recently that the Black Panthers were a socialist organization. And I don't think I'm alone in that. Um, and 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 this is why men need to come to the front. Because I know I know how it feels to be told not to cry as a little boy. You know, that's a scarring. And like I I heard Liam take a breath there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, <laughs> it, 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 it's yeah. yeah. You yeah. know how it feels. Like that that was a trigger. You just got triggered there. Not in like the pejorative sense, but like yeah. I know how that feels. I'm getting goosebumps now having having um, you know, uh flashbacks to like what it feels like to be deeply hurt or deeply in pain and being told that my natural human response is not okay because of my gender. Right. right. And it's like, right. if you don't understand that innately and you can't empathize with what that feels like, it becomes difficult to respond to it in the way that is necessary. Just like you all can't, understand necessarily how it feels to be a black man in America, or I don't know what it feels like to be a woman or, or a trans woman, you know, or, or on, on a whole spectrum of identity. Um, and so like, yeah, I really just want other, you know, men, whether it be trans or uh, cis to engage in the recovery process of some of these men and boys, because it's going to require the perspectives that we understand to make it efficient. And so, you know, so coming back, I guess, full circle, that media fight club, when I saw it, it changed my life at 17, right? I was like, it all makes sense now. We live in a society, all that good stuff. And you couldn't tell me nothing about it for darn near 10 years, probably. Um, and then I started to learn. And I was like, well, not 10 years. Let me give myself more credit. But then I, I watched a YouTube video, a video essay about it by a gay man who pointed out that this is a gay allegory and that the, the, the original writer was a gay man who at the time, I guess, I don't know if he was in the closet technically, but it was just all these things that I missed because I was focused on how it attached to who I was at the time. 
And so I've just always been interested in how that works and how people see certain things because of their standpoint or or don't see certain things because of their standpoint. I say all that to, to bring up another point that is concerning about, I guess, the modern younger left is that the left has become um, also an identity to a lot of young people, uh, uh, almost like counterculture, which is, it makes sense because the left, you had a lot of, you know, anarchist punk rock bands. You had that with uh, involved within the po political uh, spectrum. You had a lot of art and culture involved with it. And so that's great because it creates maybe a, a hook for a mm -hmm. lot of young people. But yeah. I think because it's, the left is now dominated by the bourgeois bourgeoisie whites who are who are under the age of 30 you know um that has that creates limitations in Huge. its you know ability to get back to being relevant on the world on the national stage or the world stage your own words or your own opinion like what do you think it means to actually be critical of our stories it really just to me it means to think about them in the ways that they grow and affect us um, or what they're trying to give us as pieces of art. Um, even if it's just give us something to laugh at, even if it's, you know, lowbrow, you know, stuff. A piece of media will become a piece of who you are if it connects with you like that. My curiosity is what is it, what, what is connecting with you from this piece of media? Um, people are going through this with Harry Potter, right? Um, because of, of J.K. Rowling's anti-trans stuff. So it's like, is, is their behavior so bad that by consuming their art and essentially giving them money, are you contributing to the harm of others? So for me, if the answer to that is yes, then you kind of got to let it go. Then it's like, okay, their behavior is bad, but it's like bad, like I was bad at one point in time. Bad like we all are bad at points in times. Bad as in contributing harmful ideas, being a shitty person, like it becomes a wavelength. And in that space, I say, what do you feel like you should do? I feel like it's not smart or, I don't wanna say logical. I feel like it's just not practical to create hardline rules about what art can be separated from said artists, like based, like this is the rule for everybody. I feel like that's, I feel like if, if you are no longer comfortable with that artist and that person's art, then do not listen to it. If people play it around you and you're like, this makes me uncomfortable and they don't stop, leave that space. Maybe don't hang with that person anymore. If they get mad about it, stand your ground. You know what I'm saying? And I wouldn't get mad about it if that was my situation. I, Kanye is a huge part of who I, like, I grew up with Kanye. Not grew up with him, right? But like, Kanye was the first black man to be emotional out loud in public. You know what I'm saying? So for a lot of men like myself, like canceling Kanye, like canceling Kanye and saying, I'm never consuming his work. I'm never paying attention to him. I'm never engaging in that. I, I don't I don't see that as a thing. Now, am I gonna, am I gonna excuse his behavior? Hell no, not me personally. Um, do I even like his last couple of albums? Nope. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I can't reject, you know, what I, I haven't gotten to a point with Kanye's behavior personally where I can reject what his music meant to me when I was 19, 20 years old and trying to understand myself as an emotional being as a black man, right? And so once I get to that point, I'll stop listening to Kanye, you know? Once it becomes hard, for, once like I, once if, if something else comes out about Kanye and he's in a whole other level of harm, then I'll probably get to that point. But I'm not going to personally force people to be where I'm at. Yeah. Nor am I going to force people to, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I feel like that's the best thing. The one thing I'll say about that, and I don't believe in like the whole cancel culture, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't believe in that. But I do think there's an element to people who have been voiceless having access to a powerful voice that it, that's that's very new. And initially, I was I was like, eh. I'm gonna just enjoy, I'm gonna still enjoy the music because like that's part of my childhood. And then over time, because of this rule, I can't hear it anymore. I don't listen to it. Like when I hear it, I can't stop thinking of the reality of what that person is responsible for. But the truth of the matter is you gotta live your life. 
you got to do better. My my axiom is life is short. We have we have a we have one life right now, as far as we know. Enjoy it as much as you can, while doing as little harm as you can, and trying to leave it as better than when you got here. That's my general rule for life because everything else is is real it starts getting real complicated, and so you shouldn't you shouldn't be making broad rules for very complex situations. It's it's really it really ain't. I don't need you to. I was saying this to somebody. I don't need you to introduce yourself in every comment. I need you to cut a check, share a video, join the Patreon. <laughs> don't even got to be mine. So like, don't feel bad. Random white ally, cut the check. Show the support, show the love, sure. and you, you'll feel better. We see you. This is my first piece of media since I'm as a YouTuber, so this is dope. This is a space where I'm uniquely qualified. Um, qualified. Yeah. And so thus, I really need to step up and engage.